Okay, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Tim Shanahan, I'm with the North Central Catchment Management Authority and a very warm welcome to everyone for coming along here today to the Soils Decision Making and What Next Forum at the uh, Pyramid Hill Bowling Club. Uh, it's a fantastic day for it, great to see so many people have turned up, really do welcome you here today. We have got a great uh, day, lineup of people to be able to, to go through and, and welcome in our new soil health guide uh, that we're going to be able to do. We'll listen to some locals, we'll hear from some experts, uh, we really are looking forward to today. And the purpose of today, uh, it really is about an event to highlight how important soils are to the agricultural sector. And the project that we've been running, uh, Digging Deeper for Soil Health, started in 2022 and today is the last uh, forum or event for the project. So, and it really is, a, it's been a project that we think has been really practical and held a lot of practical events over the last couple of years, such as soil pits and podcasts. And, and then, of course, today with our, our soil health guide being, being released as well. So... It has really promoted the importance of soil health, soil sampling, understanding and interpreting the soil tests and the information that you as farmers can really generate uh, with your understanding of the conditions on your farm. So I think it's, uh, it's been a fantastic project and, and today is going to be a good culmination um, for the project. Just like to acknowledge the North Central Catchment Management Authority for today's event, Agriculture Victoria uh, and the funding by the Australian Government's uh, Smart Farms Small Grants Program as well. Thanks to everyone for the efforts today that they've put on in bringing together uh, the event, which has been, um, been fantastic, and I'll acknowledge those people at the end of the day. Just uh, acknowledgement to country as well. So acknowledge the traditional owners of which uh, we meet here today, uh, the elders past, present and emerging, and pay respect to, their, to, to, to all of those people. Barapa, Barapa to the north and Jarjarung to the south as well. So to kick off today, I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Mitchell. So Rebecca is with an, as a regional manager with AgVic, based in Bendigo. Beck is passionate about soil and increasing our understanding about the interaction of soil as a biological, chemical and physical land asset. I'd please like to welcome Beck uh, forward for today. So what? my job is to get you excited about soils and set the scene. So I'm a pretty uh, passionate person and I'm pretty passionate about my soils, so hopefully I can do that. In the goodie bags, you'll have an I Heart Soil sticker, so feel free to put that on your vehicle. Uh, mine's on my laptop or anything else, and we're trying to spread the message about the importance of soils. Um... I'll turn this on, there we go. Great, a bit about me. So I've uh, been working in the region for about 12 years doing all kinds of soil things. So a mixture of being down the soil pit, talking at events like these, uh, pulling together resources. I like to talk on the radio. I like to do anything where I can promote the importance of soils and I've uh, been, had, had the privilege to work a lot with the North Central CMA on some of their resources and that's what we're here today to talk about. So briefly, what is soil and why is it important? So we're all going to have very different answers to that. So does anyone want to shout out their answer to that question? What is soil and why is it important? There you go. Yep, no soil, no farm, no food. Farming, yes, that's right. Anyone else? What do you like about soil? Why is it important? Microbes, yep. So that leans to my, my first point. So I, soil is biological, so it's living. It's got a lot going on that we can't see. There's a lot of stuff that is transparent porting everything around the soil, it's converting everything and it's making our plants grow. So, yep, definitely it's alive. Are we going to look at carbon credits? We're not going to talk about that today, but across the region in the coming uh, months and years, there's going to be a, a big kind of... Uh, push for educating uh, our farming community and ourselves about that, that topic. Um, we will be touching about soil carbon and its importance in relating to soil health. That's what we're going to be talking about today. 
The, the second part of soil that I like to focus on and think about is that it's a physical entity. So the way that soil is structured, the way that it sits in the ground uh, influences the way that roots can move. It the, influences the way that water can move. It's also the components of the, the sand, the silt and the clay. All those things make soil quite a physical being. It's also important in construction. Uh, you know, they look at soil very much as a physical thing. You know, they're doing their, you know, two metre or three, four metre deep cores and they're making sure that they don't build houses on those cracking clays so that the, you know, the structure changes. So soil's also very physical. It's also chemical. So it has all the nutrients and all the minerals that are required for our plants to grow. So that's kind of my definition of soil and why it's important. Also, as we touched on, it's the lifeblood of all the things that we're doing in farming and it's allowing our crops and plants to grow. So understanding soil and understanding why it's important and understanding the different factors in soil actually make it really important for us to be able to identify and manage any of those challenges and that's why we're here today because we've developed some resources to support that. So I'm just going to run through some of the resources that have been developed to kind of support our journey in learning and understanding in terms of soils. So what, what we've done, the first thing that we've done is we've updated the North Central Soil Health Guide. So hopefully we've, we've had this guide since 2016, so that's quite a long while now. So hopefully you've all come across this Soil Health Guide, but what we've done is we've upgraded it to... This one. So we've gone from brown to green uh, and we've included uh, a lot more information about soil carbon in this edition. So for those who aren't familiar with the Soil Health Guide, what it covers is it covers nine different soil health factors and uh, a method to how assess that on your farm and to understand a bit about it. So it goes, looks at ground cover, biological activity, colour, pH, texture, the topsoil, soil structure, soil compaction and soil stability. So that's the Soil Health Guide and a lot of the resources that we've developed have taken the concepts of the Soil Health Guide and transported them into different ways of learning because not everyone likes to read a document or have a physical copy so we've been able to extrapolate that out and uh, increase the, the ways that we can uh, reach the farming community with different resources. As well, the Soil uh, Health Guide has a Soil Health Scorecard where it brings everything together. And those nine different tests that we can do has a little bit of an indication of what is poor, what is fair and what is good. And that gives us an understanding. So not that we can compare our farming and our soil against other people's, but we might be able to identify the parts of the farm that are really productive. Well, why is that? We can go through these different tests and we can try and figure out, well, what is it that's making this area more productive or less productive? Or I've got my uh, dry land uh, grazing and then I've got my irrigated cropping. What's the difference of those? So that's what we can use the scorecard for. So the soil carbon edition, what's that all about? So what we've basically done is we've uh, taken the soil carbon snapshot, which is a really good document that was uh, recently re-released um, by Agriculture Victoria and Fertiliser Australia, which tops, touches on all these really important soil carbon uh, topics and factors and information. And there's a lot of information out there about soil carbon and it's not all, uh, it's not all good information and it's not all helpful information. So we like to use the soil carbon snapshot as our point of truth for some good science and some good information. So what we've done is essentially taken that information from that document and pulled it into this one. So we've looked at why is soil carbon important, soil carbon and the climate, what is soil carbon, how much carbon is in Australian soils, building soil carbon, 10 key considerations for soil carbon changes, management practices, options and evidence, carbon farming and soil carbon, and then importantly, how each of these nine soil health factors is actually influenced and, um, and interacts with soil carbon. So that's, that's what we've done to uh, make the soil health guide, the soil health carbon edition. Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about some more of those resources that we've been developing as well. 
So that's all great to have to have all the information in printed hard copy, but sometimes some of us like to learn by watching someone else do it. So what we've done is we've actually taken all of these soil health factors and we've created uh, these videos about how to actually do that test and a little bit of information about that. So uh, I am in all of the videos. Uh, I tell you, it's not a fun process having to review yourself <laughs> and watch yourself uh, 10 times. Uh, anyway, these are really, really good resources and there wasn't anything like this out there. I remember when we went, uh, I don't want to mention it, but into COVID times, we had to really change how we delivered information. And I really wanted to find some resources that really quickly and succinctly and usefully explain some of these factors. I had to go to some weird American sites and all of this because I couldn't find anything that really hit the, hit the job. So that was what was really exciting about this project. We could actually develop them. And these have only been up for a month. I took this screenshot two days ago and it's already had quite a lot of views and nothing's been promoted yet because this is the launch for all these resources. So uh, not surprising, you know, um, Topsoils had 180 views, Biological Activities 129. So there's definitely a lot of interest in these resources. And what's exciting is the Soil Health Guide can link to these. So you can have this book, but then you can also link to the videos. So uh, really exciting that we're going to have these resources. Um, and I promise it's not me and like 130 of my friends watching them. So... So that's the videos. We've also got some podcasts. So um, Joe Bear, who we're going to hear a bit more from today, was involved in this project. And this was one of the things that she worked really um, wonderfully on with uh, six different farms in the... And I don't know if any of you are here today, uh, but if you are, thank you for being part of this and sharing your soil journey and stories. So the, we've got these podcasts and it's exactly that. People talking about their journey, talking about why soils are important to their farm. They're sitting on the North Central CMA website and uh, also part of all of these uh, resource packages that we're working on. Okay, well, what, are, what am I most excited about? Well, what I'm most excited about is the fact that we've been able to pull all of these different things together into what we're calling the Soil Resources eBook. So this is where all of the information that sits in here has gone digital, but also including the videos, including the podcasts, including other useful links, and it's made it all accessible on the web. And so that's you'll see QR codes on your little goodie bags going everywhere. They link to this information. So what I've done is to show you a little bit about how you can actually interact with this information. It's going to be a little bit dodgy because I used my phone to, to film myself clicking because I didn't know if we'd have internet. But this is, um, this is what it looks like. And you can go, you can click on these different sections. This is the introduction. Sorry, we're going to zoom through things really fast. Uh, this is a little bit about the soil carbon information, some useful videos. Um, clicking through, it's, it's interactive. It's, uh, it's all there. We um, then will have a look at... Um, one of the different soil health factors, so going to soil pH. Well, the information that sits in the soil health guide is actually in here, but it's just a little bit more interactive um, and a little bit more information can sit here. We've got some maps, um, we've got our scales, and then it goes through how to actually assess it, some extra videos, extra information that's useful, and going back to the soil health score, what's poor, what's fair, what's good and then our video, which actually talks you through how to actually do that test on farm. We've added in some really cool features. Um, so, for example, we were out at um, Joe and Greg Bear's property and we got to take some uh, really cool videos and photos and we've uh, turned some of that into a kind of interactive soil pit. So this is a soil event and we don't have a soil pit, but we've got... We've got a way to actually learn a little bit about soil and feel like we're in there. So this was um, one of the soils on their property and it's got all of the chemical data um, and this is what we've turned into the virtual soil pit. So you can actually feel like you're in the soil. I want to develop a few more of these across the region um, because I think they're a really useful tool 
to be able to feel and explore the soil. So this is still a work in progress, but this is an example, I guess, of what we can do. So uh, it also links to some further resources that are available. So other different books that are useful, other videos, um, little promo for my newsletter, um, and that's about it. So that was a really, really quick run through, but we've got uh, in the lunch break or afterwards, uh, we've got a, a screen over there where you can come have an interact or um, if you like, you can scan the QR code now and you can, or maybe later when, uh, when we're in the break and you can and have a look at those resources. So we've tried to factor in all the different ways that us as adults learn, whether it's like audio through the podcast, visual through the videos, uh, practical through being able to uh, interact with the technology or through reading. So uh, that was a really quick run through. Thank you for uh, being here, learning about these resources and, um, and uh, hearing about how soils and, and farming really is, uh, is moving forward and how we can uh, factor our soils into our decision making. So... This is just, when you use that QR code, it'll take you through to the different resources uh, and interacting with those. So, thank you. Uh, we'll go on to our next speaker. So, I'd like to introduce Brad Drust. Brad is the CEO of the North Central Catch and Management Authority. Brad has a really strong focus on effective project delivery and community engagement. Acknowledging that the CMA, local communities, traditional owners, industry, science and government need to work together to achieve natural resource outcomes. Um, Brad is going to be here today to launch um, and do some, uh, do some cutting of the cake, hopefully at one stage or another. So what I'll do is I'll pass over to Brad. All right, thanks very much, Tim, and um, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming along today um, to celebrate the launch of the new Soil Health Guide, um, the Carbon Edition, and a whole range of associated resources, um, an e-book and step-by-step -step videos. Um, as you might know, CMAs have been around for a while now, 1997 in fact, CMAs were, were created. Um, and since that time, um, we've had a really strong focus uh, on soil. Um, we're not just an environmental organisation, we work across the whole spectrum of natural resources, so land, water, biodiversity, and we, as you know, um, given that you're in the room today, do a lot of work with farmers. Um, and in that time we've been working with farming communities to increase everyone's knowledge and skills um, in managing soils. Just wanted to say a few things about um, that work over time before we get to the get to the launch. There is, some, there is some cake here, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, this project, Digging Deeper for Soil Health, um, has continued our work on soils with farmers, um, helping farmers to not only look at the top soil, but to delve deeper um, into the subsoils and understand how soil changes with depth. Um, we've done all this because helping um, farmers have a good understanding of soil um, will assist in making better decisions. As you all know, you're faced with those decisions day to day uh, on a farm, for those of you who, um, who work on a farm and own a farm. Um, and that those decisions are really important to improve soil health and ultimately um, sustainability and productivity of your farms. I asked Darren for a few little facts and figures about soils and topsoils. Um, and I'm sure you'd all appreciate that they're one of the most valuable assets on your farm. And, um, under natural conditions take many years to form, so they take a long time to form, but they're easy to blow away. Um, and like any asset, it's really important that we look after our topsoils, given their importance. Um, things like maintaining good ground cover is critical to protect your topsoil. Um, wind erosion, as we know, can lead to um, significant losses in topsoils. Um, Darren tells me up to 13 tonnes per hectare in a year. Uh, can blow away and not only the soil but all the nutrients and everything that goes with it um, and that's the sort of erosion like maybe you don't really notice it um, but of course can have a really big really big impact on a on a farm because we rely on that topsoil to recycle organic matter uh, provide habitat for all that biological activity in the soil which we're learning more and more about and its importance um, and of course provide 
nutrients for plant growth. Um, CMAs do our best work when we work with others. Um, so most of the work that we do will be working partnership and I, I wanted to um, make a nod to the team from Agriculture Victoria um, that have been involved in the delivery of this project and the work with on farms with soil pits, um, demonstrations using the soil health guide and a whole range of other um, things to help understand and better understand soils. Um, we know uh, that farmers are faced with a series of new sustainability challenges. So uh, we've been talking about soils for a while now, but there's more and more things to come. Um, feels like, I'm sure for some of you, this sort of never ending wave of things that you have to respond to. So um, making decisions in response to those things is really important and making effective decisions is, is more important than ever. So between a, a variable climate, new market opportunities around carbon and natural capital, if you've tuned into some of the things that our federal government's saying, um, those ongoing issues with water, um, you know, perhaps a bit of a sleeping giant with salinity, um, finding useful advice to make those decisions quickly um, is important, but it can be difficult. Um, and that's, I guess, part of the reason for the event today um, and also the soil health guide that um, it's been put together through this project. Um, the North Central CMA, just to go back to some of that history, over what's nearly 30 years now, the North Central CMA has had a, a long association with farming communities through lots of different projects. So the Farming for Sustainable Soils project um, formed, formed a group in this area, and I think there might have been a few in the room around in 2015 when that sort of project got off the ground or that group got off, off the ground. So thank you for your ongoing work and your um, work alongside the North Central CMA. Um, that project's coming to an end now, but we're really looking forward to more opportunities over time to get new projects and new initiatives off, off the ground. And we hope to have some, um, some information out and about on that in the near future. Um, but for now, talking about um, supporting our, our farming community, it does give me great pleasure to, to launch the new Soil Health Guide and all of those resources that come with it, um, that special carbon edition of the Soil Health Guide and the, the e-book and the step-by-step um, -step videos that accompany it. Um, it really is intended to be a one-stop shop for anyone who's got an interest in soil and understanding soils more. And I really do hope that um, you've had the opportunity to take a look uh, either prior to now or you take that opportunity into the future and that you find the resources that have been developed really useful. Um, I would like to recognise those who've um, had a hand in putting the Soil Health Guide together um, and I'd like uh, to ask those in the room to join me in thanking those people with a round of applause and they're going to they're gonna feature in this next bit in just a minute. So round of applause first, thank you very much. Farming business at Lodden Vale. Uh, they've got over 5,000 merino ewes to produce both self-replacing flock and some first cross la ewe lambs as well. Their approach has been centred on regenerative agriculture and holistic management, uh, with the sheep being a vital tool for positive environmental change. They focus on building natural resources and embrace change. I've definitely seen them embrace change. They've been... Uh, uh, four leaders, I would say, in that front, looking for new and exciting possibilities. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'll interview Joe and Greg to hear about their journey and their thoughts on Soil Health Guide, how they tackle improving soil carbon emissions and this new thing called natural capital accounting. So what I thought I'd do is just give Greg and Joe the opportunity just to give us a bit of a brief overview of their system where they are, what they do, how they go about it. So they've both got a microphone, they can chip in. I see they've got notes here. Um, so who would like to start? Yeah, I can, Tim. Go. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll actually just give you a bit of an introduction so it gives you a bit of a background on how, how it all the madness works at home. Um, we, we, um, we live between Pyramid Hill here, Bort and Kerrang. Um, if you put a put lines in between, we're sort of roughly in that area on the Loddon floodplain. That's where our, ho our home base is. Um, predominantly dry land. We've got um, uh, around 350, 400 acres of irrigation as well. 
Um, so for us, um, uh, so overall, uh, we own about 3,340 hectares and we manage about 8,000 hectares all up with, our, with the business. Um, so not only at home, we've also got um, more country that we've purchased north of Krang and another block up near Benjeroop on the Lodden River up there. And we've also got, um, uh, we've got an arrangement with Park Victoria west of Barbal out in the Mallee. So, um, so we've, so taking a step back, we, we were traditional farmers at home with irrigation predominantly and dry land, run cattle, sheep, cropping, hay, uh, like what everyone else around, we were just trying to make a dollar, trying to learn. Um, and eventually we realised that there was areas we, we were a bit frustrated with cropping. Me, me and my brother weren't uh, uh, great at machinery. Um, we love livestock. My father loves livestock. So, uh, so eventually we went to a holistic grazing management course, which was um, around 1999, 1998, I think roughly. Um, and at, the, at that point we realised within that business it was actually, just quickly, it, was, it actually just concentrates on five main things which is which is soil or your assets um, um, also finance uh, people all everything and that's why they call it holistic it's about it's about treating all things equally and, and making them all just as important as each other so with the with the grazing side of the holistic grazing management it was about it was about doing um, what nature probably more nature was taught and and about how how plants grow and we sort of came out of it thinking that um, doing things that the modern day farmers doing was probably fighting against the system a bit. You know, uh, high, uh, high, a lot higher risk, um, a lot more higher, you know, various chemical, whatever else working up, and et cetera. So we sort of, we sort of um, got pretty warm about the whole idea of this. So we, we decided to um, um, basically just get rid of the cattle, get rid of the, sh get rid of the cropping, and fortunately, about the same time, we bought um, some more land. So it actually all worked in really well that we had the scope then to actually do a larger scale grazing with one enterprise. Let's, let's just go for it, you know. And um, so as I spoke to Tim at lunchtime, is it, strangely enough, we've fallen into a lot of this. We've, we've, we've realised that we've probably um, been learning as we're going along Working out, um, working out ways to handle you know, large mobs of sheep with with water issues, all this sort of stuff. So it's not perfect, um, you know. Having not having big enough pipes, and we had to put bigger pipes in, uh, bigger flows, different systems. But we've actually just gone through and learned. We've got we've had grants to fence off, fence off areas, which which made it efficient for having more paddocks and and whatever else. So. The whole idea of the holistic grazing management is having trying to have as large a mobs as you possibly can um, for a shorter time in a paddock and then we move them. That's the simplistic of it all. So the idea is that we give the paddocks enough rest that the plants grow big enough so that they maintain a root system underneath. So that's where the benefits of the soil is. is. Um, so yeah, look, it's, it's, uh, it's a system we've grown with and the system for us is adapted for us really we it's not we we don't claim to be sole grazers which is kind of what the holistic grazing management is we're still on reasonable sized paddocks but we're we're sort of just compromising it to, to suit us so um that's that's probably enough at this stage do you think tim yeah, yeah. anything from you joe it's like joe's a little bit nervous but she's going to be very very good at this as we know look how important is soil and how important is soil health for your property and the work that you've been doing over the years? Um, for us, for us, the soil we've we've learnt that the soil is the number one thing in terms of the of your um, your land, you know, um, and outside your own skills and whatever else that's w that's within your business. Uh, the soil the soil is key in terms of um, for us that improvement creates. Um, um, better growth, long, longer growing for your for your feed, all all the things that we just didn't know until when, uh, when we started. But we are now starting to learn that our our pasture, you know, the, the, the whatever's growing is growing for longer. We're getting probably a month, six weeks more longer than we did at the start. We're getting um, some paddocks up to 80, 80 plants, so there's there's variety 
um, coming into the system, so you're getting healthier animals. Um, there's there's a lot of things that come in um, that we realised that fortunately we were patient to stick with it a bit, you know, longer than um, some things you just don't see in the, mm. in the first ten years. And um, and now we're actually because we've sort of learnt as we've gone along. Um, I think I think the soil does. Uh, if you look after it, it looks after you. My opinion. So, what did you need to know? You were talking about improvement there too, Greg. What did you need to know to be able to make the improvement? What were the key things you had to find out about your soils to make that improvement? The the holistic side of it, um, from what we learned from our course, was um, the main ones we were sticking with was ground cover and diversity of plants. Mm. So that's 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 really the basics of what we were looking at when we were grazing. So. Hence, behind that, there's monitoring, there's soil tests, um, there's a lot of things. There's there's grazing management plans. We've drawn up twenty odd plans behind all that, just to sort of realise that this is where we're wanting to be good at and, and measure and and um, and be confident that that not only just thinking that it's going to be right, you actually are backing it up with things behind it. And when you said you had to get a variety of ground cover and. And what, why? Why did you have to get a variety? Why couldn't you stick with one and think that'll do the job? What did the variety do that you found was the benefit? Um, well, I think, I think uh, we, still get at, we still have annuals in our um, pasture, but the perennial base has the, certainly has the variety because um, if, if you end up with, um, say, just looking at one particular grass, it, be, it becomes a monoculture. It's a similar thing to a crop, really, and I don't, I don't think it's good for... Um, we're now looking at insects, birds, whatever is going to come into the area. We're we're actually now looking at um, what other things do you that benefit outside of our own business. And having variety is is something that that will bring you in healthy stock, which I mentioned. Mm. Um, it's it's got um, uh, every, every place naturally has got a place for everything, mm. and I think that's where. It, it, um, there is probably some grasses that are unpalatable for stock that we have, yep. but we, we, we realise they've got great root systems. Mm. So we've, we're happy to forgo those areas, and it, and it could be, it could be half of our area mm. might have unpalatable grasses, but it's actually helping the, the soil under the ground, okay. and it's helping, in, in, it's helping to bring those other small things around it, those small bushes and plants and creepers and, and whatever else that grow. Yeah, okay. So the soil health was your number one priority and about improving that. Now, no doubt you would have found some issues as well with your soil health. Did you, in doing that testing, it might be across your farm, differences across paddocks as well. What issues have you found with your soil health and what solutions have you come up with um, to be able to mitigate those? Yeah, it's a good point. We're, we're, the majority of our ground we have cropped before. We've, we have got some paddocks that have never been never been uh, worked. Um, um, I think initially it's it's just um, it's 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 just getting the soil structure stable again. You know, the soil stable. Yep. That's that's a really important one. I think it's uh, um, earlier on you are going to get um, what they call compan you know, companion plants or um, groups of, of of singular plants growing in certain areas, and eventually, eventually they can't survive there as they are. So eventually, we do get other things. Coming in around, you know, in amongst it. Yep. So it, it it tells you that, um, you know, in a, I'm talking in the short term. I'm talking ten mm. to fifteen years. Mm. You you don't see a, a lot bar for monocultures, and I can understand why people see that, and then, and then they go, oh, let, that we'll just we've just got to work this up because it's it's something they don't want, and yep. it's something we didn't want either. But we had that we had that trust because we already had some paddocks that we. That, that hadn't been worked, yep. that we could see that there was real potential yeah, there. Okay. Um, that's kind of where we, where we were sort of heading. And how are you testing it? How are you knowing that it was going to be, there was a change or there was a difference? Like, how are you testing it? Were you keeping that information somewhere? Were you comparing on farm to other farms, to other places in Australia? How did you know that there was a change going on, even if it was a, took a long time to see that change? I suppose we... Oh, is that on? So for a start, we've done photo monitoring. I think photo monitoring is a really easy thing. Um, uh, so we do that every year um, in summer and also in winter. 
Um, so that's... Why summer and winter? Why did you choose those times of uh, year? Because they're the growing and non-growing season in our area. Um, so we wanted to capture, um, probably as Greg said, the growing seasons, much more annuals um, in there, introduced annuals probably. Um, and then in the non grow well, we can argue about that because in summertime we say non-growing for uh, introduced species, but a lot of native species are growing in summer. Um, so we do that. Um, I think that's prob and what else? Um, and then also counting, um, I did have done probably every five years is actually doing um, grids and actually stepping out what um, um, species we've got. But also we've had ecologists come in, which has been really helpful to actually work out what diversity of plants um, we've got. Um, but, you know, I think that's where the soil health guide, I might bring that in. Um, I think that's going to be a real um, big thing for us. You know, I, um, to tell everyone, I worked um, at the CMA for about six months helping with this project. And that's where I got introduced to Beck and also the soil health guide. So I was involved in um, bringing that together. Um, admittedly, I was sceptic. Um, when I first uh, arrived thinking, oh, it's just another, another guidebook that we're never going to have any chance to use and it's not going to be very effective. Well, as the people in the CMA will say, I've become a bit evangelistic about it all now um, because it is a really great guide, a really... Um, and we're looking... We've actually just started doing a lot of our paddocks as um, baseline paddocks as another form of monitoring, Tim. What, and yeah. just explain what you mean by baseline paddocks too, Joe, and what you use them for. Yeah, so baseline paddocks, really, we've um, picked mainly the dry land paddocks um, to actually uh, get a, a measurement on them, you know, so for ground cover, for our pH um, structure, um, bi micro um, biological activity um, and just record that and then we'll go back in five years time because really our, our philosophy is to do not much in our um, farming system. We're on a floodplain so we have had quite a few floods over the last few years and we have to believe that because we're on a floodplain that these soils want to be flooded and over a, a, a period of time, this is the best thing for these soils. Um, but we would like, and we might have chance to talk about natural capital accounting a bit later, but we want to have some data to back these things up. You know, it's one thing to tell people, oh, it's all lovely, we're on a floodplain and, you know, everything grows beautifully and things like that. But, you know, I, I can make a nice story about that, but I think it's really good to be able to back it up with data. And, and I think, yes, we can do our soil testing, that is the best, but I think as farmers, we've got a capacity to do our testing ourselves. And I wanted to mention the other great thing about using the Soil Health Guidebook is getting out on your paddocks. How often do we have the chance to just walk our paddocks, dig up a little hole and have a look at it we don't get, well, I don't get much chance. I'm always flying over there on the bike to get a mob of sheep or going over there on the ute, just getting out there, putting aside a day, you know, um, or a few days a year. It's just really beneficial, you know. We just don't do that very often. And I actually, I was reading about a study where um, someone did a study, people who handle soil, actually their finding are much more healthier because of that biological activity, it's really beneficial to yeah, us. Right. Um, so, yeah, so the Soil Health book, um, what blew me away with that, um, I went around a number of farms and I visited a farm um, in Bort and it was an old irrigation block and you can imagine really compacted grey clay soils and when I went there, there was just weeds everywhere, but it was green. It was in sort of about this time last year. It was lots of different weeds, lots of, but lots of things growing. And when I parted the soil to start this um, test, you know, there was lots of bugs there 
And as soon as I um, dug it, and you'll see in there, the structure was just to die for. And it just blew me away because I just thought clay soils would never have good structure, you know. And, and it just, just transformed my thought about what you can do with your soil. Um, so whenever I, when I went to other places and I saw good ground cover, lots of biological activity, I thought, and I didn't even have to dig, I thought this is going to be great soil. And, and it, it always was. We know that carbon, that carbon is built from humus and humus is from organic matter and biological activity. And um, so, you know, there's so much we can learn and so much to aim for. And I think the guidebook really gives us some good indicators of what we can aim for. What Beck didn't talk about was the, um, the weighting that they have in that guidebook. So there's certain things like ground cover um, that's weighted by three, so you times it by three. And I think that's such a good useful, useful tool because it actually tells you what you can do. You've got control of that, not control of topsoil. Really, topsoil is, top, is what you get. But you've got cover... Um, You've got control over your ground cover and, and, and it makes a huge difference. So if you really um, have a look at those weightings that are in the guidebook as well, I think that's a really great indicator of what you've got control over. And you would have seen that not only on your farm, but the what would you do six other properties, I think, too, yep. Joe, didn't you? So yep. you've been across those and you've walked away thinking ground cover's the key. Yep. Yeah, and okay. biological activity. Yeah, okay. Yep. And... and what I was going to say with Greg before with that diversity, I think having something growing all year round is the key, you know, because that feeds your bugs, you know, we talk about bugs, you know, and so that diversity, if we've got things growing all year round, just makes a huge impact as well. So you, the adding of the native grasses into your, into your uh, pasture systems is giving you the ability to have that all round grass a cover, that, isn't it, on your farm? You've That's the theory, yeah. 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 But you've <laughs> yeah. been doing that for quite a while now, haven't you? Yeah, Being but, you know, we're having... Um, you know, there's always challenges, isn't there? Mm. You know, at the moment with the flood, we've got the good old windmill grass, which we're not very popular with some, you know... So some of our paddocks are just monocultures of windmill grass. And as Greg said, you have got that um, natural thought, oh, I'll just work it all up. Mm. But then we've had people say to us, this is a coloniser, you know, just give it time, it'll change. But sometimes that's really hard when we've got, we're trying to make it, we've got a business and we want to make money, you know, it's just that challenge as well. I was going to ask you, that must be hard and I could see the look on Greg's face when he was talking about it as well. What makes you commit to not ripping it up and staying with your belief? What there must be there must be an economic reason for doing it, and obviously there's some values that you hold for it as well. What what holds you back from jumping in the tractor and ripping it up? Um, I that's a really good question. I I, st I think there's at least three or four things you do before you work the ground up. Um, there's nothing wrong with actually just running in, and putting a crop, you know, putting a cereal through it, or something just to sort of change the dynamics yep. of that paddock. And just keep whatever's there, you know. Mm. Just um, I, I, I wouldn't be afraid to just yeah, just sow something in there and yep. just and just see what happens. Okay, great. Uh, economically, what you know is there a benefit? Have you seen it over time of not ripping it up as well? Have you seen the productivity improve? Have you seen it, you know, been able to stay with it and seen that economic benefit at the same time? Oh, well, yeah, that's a really good question. We probably don't study the economics of, of doing, indiv you know, individual things like that, Tim, but um, um, I, think, I think the idea is that if you're, if you're not having to do a lot of it mm. in your, in your, within your farm, yep. you know, you can absorb that, you know, that area and, and if you're committed to doing something, yeah, you, you're trying to change that area and then you'll tweak and you'll, you know, we're, we're sort of even now looking at putting bushes, plants, whatever. We'll say whatever we can mm. that's, that's eaten by animals mm. uh, or sheep. Um, we'll put it, whatever we can into a, into a system. Yeah, and by it, default, by not doing that, you're actually reducing your input costs anyway. So, yeah, so yeah. We, we sort of, whatever we're trying to do is it's a bit, a bit, a bit more of the long term. So whatever decision we make... It's a, a. It's got to be a little bit towards what our purpose is. You know okay. what we really believe in. Yep. Uh, and I think if you if you get sidetracked, 
um, you kind of lose your way a little bit on why you're doing it. So you've got some core values that you're holding uh, dear and you're sticking with those really is, is what some of your decision-making factors is really sticking to those core values. Definitely, yep. yep. Okay. What about um, carbon emissions? You've been involved in carbon emissions a little bit as well. Is there anything um, there that you want to tell us about or your understanding of the soil tests and kits and, and work you've been doing in the carbon emissions space? Well, it's a nice segue to what we were just talking about, I think, Tim. I think um, probably going back to their core values mm. is that probably we're now realising that rather that we need another arm to our business than just sheep. Um, and luckily how we're following our in that environmental side, we have come upon other mm. opportunities. Um, so that first one was the Ag Steward. It was Australian government um, funded project where um, the Australian government wanted to encourage farmers to do um, plant trees for um, carbon offsets, to sell carbon offsets. So we um, took part in that. And so basically um, we've put aside seven hectares of our land and planted 2,800 trees on that and then we um, are then registered with the emissions uh, clean energy regulator to then sell um, um, ACUs which are an Australian carbon credit units on the open market. Um, so uh, we got involved in that. Mm. Um, it's because it's under a regulatory body it is quite onerous and you've really got to set, um, you've got to be um, really strict in the guidelines. Um, so there is, so it's a little bit uncomfortable, I think, if that's a word I describe because it's sort of unknown, but um, you are assured of a 25-year um, income stream. Um, and we could see that, you know, we've got a fairly big farm so we could see that uh, we could put aside seven hectares. I think it's really good just to put aside a paddock for that. Um, and and we realise that our region is very good at knowing about how to grow trees. Mm. We are really... I, I didn't realise until I started working at the CMA how many regions have got no idea about growing trees. But we've just got this really good learning. We've got really good um, plant nurseries who can help. Um, and, you know, we've just got that innate knowledge for us all, really. Mm. So, so that's been really interesting. I'm not sure whether it's a goer or not, but we're still working in that because it fits with our values. Um, and, and so going back to what you were saying, Tim, you know, we're just sort of probably value orientated. Um, we've also been involved in the biodiversity funding and that is much easier. You know, it's, it's getting funded for what we're doing. Um, soil carbon, I think, is a whole different ball game. Um, yeah, you know, I think carbon just changes all the time with droughts, floods, you know, and I, yeah, I think that's uh, still an interesting but space. But it sounds like you've dipped your toe in, you've got seven yep. hectares, you're seeing, having a bit of a look at it. Yeah. It's not too much of your enterprise that you're putting in there, but it's worth having a look. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and like Beck said before, we all learn differently. I probably learn by doing um, and so it ha you're exactly right. It wasn't a big um, economic um, outlay, but it, at least we were experiencing it. Great. And what about like your farming system into the future? Is there anything else that you're looking forwards to and wanting to, to do maybe a little bit differently, trying, thinking about, you know, you know anything in that regard as well? I've got a few things written down, Tim. Oh, have you? <laughs> Just <laughs> I did this morning. <laughs> uh, no, it's a really good. It's a really good question because we, um, um, uh, we both we both enjoy having people, are, you know, and showing people. Um, we don't believe it's just our land. I think mm. we really like to have people, and um, so we've actually got a hip camp. If, you've, if anyone's heard of hip camps, we've got a hip camp on the Loddon River, so you can look at that up on hipcamp.com. Um, we love We love education. Uh, we love um, so we've spoken to a university. They're they're actually keen to have a uh, design etc. Um, come up. We've got a, we've got a great location for that. 
um, design, environmental design. There's there's a number of areas of design that they were keen to come up. That was RMIT. Um, yeah, carbon planning, biodiversity agreements, uh, cl collaborations with larger companies. Uh, that includes in that you know biodiversity payments or meat sold that goes into a into a company, or even just. Um, uh, your future breeding, if you're selling breeding sheep, you can have them as, as emissions neutral so that it actually t it saves them carrying on that, that cost of emissions. So there's a number of areas that, are, that, that it's seriously heading that way. Yep. 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 Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of areas in this space that, you can, that we're sort of thinking of and where we are heading. Um, whether it's another enterprise, another, another animal, whether it's a chook, you know, uh, chook thing. Who knows? You know, we're open for anything to that. Um, in particular, because we've got three boys, and, and um, you know, if, if there's something there that they can do, like managing the, you know, potentially uh, uh, some sort of contract, yep. and they could be just living in Melbourne, and they yep. can manage that. Yep. So we're really looking at utilising our kids if they are, if they are keen as well. And how are you getting these options? Where are these thought-provoking ideas coming from? Where are you getting it all from? You're just keeping an open mind. You're just looking as much as you possibly can. I think um, it goes back to what Greg said before. I think we're probably really clear on our values yeah. um, and a purpose, I suppose. So I think then you have conversations with people. And, you know, we're just, um, yeah. Um, I, I think, I don't know, it's right in... Uh, in uh, being uh, a bit too esoteric or something, you know, it's just working with the environment is pretty cool and there's lots of really interesting people out there who want to work with you in the environment. So you're right, you know, having an open mind but also having a clear idea of what our values are and what we can accept and what we're a little bit not accepting um, is really good and, yeah, so we just... Yeah, having Good. a bit of fun, I suppose. <laughs> so speaking of sort of new and emerging, different terminology, different way of thinking about the environment as well as natural capital yep. or natural capital accounting. So it's sort of, it's you know, there was ecosystem services and how do you generate greater benefits out of your natural environment and what you're doing on farm and now this new terminology around nat uh, natural capital accounting. Any thoughts on that of your experiences or what you've noticed about this over the last little while? Yeah, so we were lucky um, to be involved with La Trobe Uni uh, working um, and created a project and we were one of the pilot farms in that. There was, um, I think, around 50 in Victoria and quite a number of um, cropping um, farms. Alison will be able to... Uh, 15 in Victoria. 15. 50 between the states. Thank you, Alison. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically the idea of natural capital accounting is that they're wanting to get um, data um, to create figures that um, show the, um, the natural capital of your farm. Um, and, uh, and so we were interested in doing that, getting back to what I was saying before, you can make a lovely um, story about your environment on your farm, but it'd be really nice to be able to to capture some actual data. Um, and so they basically look at ground cover, um, your connectivity of your farm with uh, environmental corridors, as a, a, a brief overview of that, um, your soil condition, um, how close your, your landscape is to a, a natural environment, um, and then your riparian or your aquatic um, condition as well. And so really you get figures for that and then you can actually sh um, use that as, once again, a baseline so and benchmark it on your farm over a number of years and, and work out where you want to improve and how you've improved or, um, or else the other idea is that we go to a bank and say, well, this is our financial performance but this is our natural performance as well. So it's a, a form of communicating to your stakeholders and maybe a form of communicating to your to potential new um, collaborators, if I've explained that yeah, good. well enough. So yeah. we've had um, people come and do um, look on our farm. Basically what they're hoping to do 
um, after this pilot project is that they're going to use um, satellites to actually look at your farm much more than having to come onto your farm because imagine having ecologists come on your farm all the time, the expense of that. So they're wanting to use satellite imagery. But, yeah, so I think there's real upside to that. Okay. Um, yeah. No, so it's, it's worth really keeping an eye on it, too. Yep, yep. Great. Yep. Yeah, they're, they're also, I mean, the, this, this federal government, we were fortunate, Joe, we went up, we went up to uh, Canberra last spring and, and um, uh, the, the uh, ag agricultural minister, federal minister spoke there and they, they are really pushing mm. currently, I think governments are really pushing that if, if you've got a, a bit of um, trade country, which in the past as farmers we've had to just look after it, um, they are really interested in actually paying property you know, owners to have assets like that okay. as well. So that, that space could, you know, could change um, in terms of rewarding people for, for looking after assets. Yeah, right. Very, Very good. Um, gee, we're lucky to have these two to be able to talk to today and just learn from their experiences and listen to their journey as well. So if you could put a, uh, you know, congratulate these guys by putting your hands together and thanking them for their time today. Okay, so moving on from a, a practical experience and a journey that we've been able to listen to uh, with the Bears, we'll move on to that decision-making process and thinking about all of those different permutations and, and what people need to do, some practical insights into that as well. And I'd like to, to welcome Kate Burke from Think Agri. Um, to give a little presentation. Kate was born and raised at Elmore, now living in Echuca on a farm there and farming at Turumbury as well. Uh, and Kate's been an agri-strategist, agri author and keynote speaker for 30 years now on specialist knowledge and experience in the science and strategy of broadacre farming and direct investment in farmland. Kate connects the dots between people, productivity and profit to build better farmers, better farms and healthy, thriving families and communities. Kate's vision is for half of the farm business in Australia to double their productivity and then their return on investment. It's a win-win for farmers, agribusiness, consumers and ecosystems to have twice as much food produced from the same area of land in a responsible and sustainable manner. Welcome, Kate. Thanks, Tim. Who reckons I'm mad? <laughs> Why? Why not? Um, I spent a fair bit of time the other day writing a speech and it's there on, um, on that clipboard. But usually, once I get into a room, I throw the notes away and uh, we'll, we'll see where we, we go. Um, I'm very nervous for a couple of reasons. Um, after after listening to Joe and, um, and Greg, everyone everyone loves hearing a farming story and hear a couple of people yarn about their farm, and so they then have someone else stand up after that. Um, you probably all thinking, "Oh God, what's she going to talk about?" Um, there's a lot in common with the messages from Joe and Greg to, I guess, what I want to say. So I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about why it makes commercial sense as well as environmental sense to look after your soil. So I want to do that first. And then I want to talk about ways of navigating decision-making in an uncertain and complex world. So that's so. Um, I've got to keep an eye on the time. I've uh, I want to be on the four o one train from Bendigo to Melbourne because um, you'll notice I've got footy socks on. I'm being efficient. I'm going to the footy tonight. When I was getting dressed this morning, I thought I'm running on a pretty tight schedule. So I dressed in red, black, and white, um, ready to go to the footy. So I'll be watching that clock a bit, and that will. Uh, stop me from crapping on too much. Um, but I will start with, with a story. And I've been coming to Pyramid Hill for a while. There's a couple of cheeky blokes in the room here, Nev and Bruce, that I met in the, um, 
in the 2000s. Now, many of you in the room would know Harm Van Rees and Anne Jackman. So when Harm and Anne ran away from us all and went to New Guinea, they asked me to facilitate a discussion group that, that was here in Pyramid Hill. And that was the Pyramid Hill Farm Management 500 group. And Nev and Bruce, and was there anyone else in the room part of that group? Because we've all got a bit older and greyer and stuff, just in case that's good. So I, I haven't missed anyone. And I got to um, know those guys really well during a really, really, it was a pretty ta challenging time, wasn't it, fellas? It wasn't raining much. Pea fertiliser went up to about 1200 bucks at one stage, I seem to recall. So rising costs aren't new things. Um, and I, what I got to observe, Keith O'Toole was in the group too, the Scots, um, Berkey, the Gunthers, and, um, and there were others. I got to see adaptation to a changing environment and a changing business environment firsthand. And I also got to see the human toll and the human spirit of really, really tough, tough times. And um, the other Pyramid Hill connection is, is a uh, old bloke, he's 91, so I'm allowed to call him old, called John Kelly, that farmed out at Jungleborough. And John and I are neighbours at Turumbri. We've got land across the road from each other. And a long time ago, in the mid-80s, I went to boarding school with John's daughter, Louise. And I managed to buy some farmland only five years ago now, four years ago. And John's basically been my farming mentor. And when the floods happened, we've got a water course through our place and it did get wet. Uh, I grabbed John and went for a drive and I reckon I could draw you a picture where every direction water flows from uh, Jungabara to Echuca, all on the back of John Kelly's knowledge. So there's so much knowledge in this room. So I'm not here to tell you how to farm or how to suck eggs because... You guys are pretty good at doing that yourself and Tom, you and I have ran into each other a few times and again, you've got a, a, a really good farming system that works for you and your family and one of your values is people and um, what you've done for this community because of your love of people is, uh, is you know, is so good that it's been on telly. So um, I think we all are really resonated with the comment about about values and often it doesn't get talked enough about when we're when I'm sitting at the science advisory committee of the CMA with with Brad for example or uh, you know in, in a room with policy makers often in the past we've concentrated on the science all the economics and often we forget about the people and even now we've talk, we're far more cognizant of the importance of well-being, but again, there's a risk of talking only about well-being and in a, um, a reparative way rather than a preventative way and not in the context of the economics and the people. And the Bears talked about holistic management and the holistic course that you did all those years ago. I like to think that this little book that I um, wrote in the pandemic is the cropping version of that. And um, Sue's nodding her head off. <laughs> oh, thank you. That's a good... That's, um, that's pretty handy. So I wrote the book because I couldn't find what I was looking for when I was trying to get people to connect the dots between you know, um, all the things that helped you have a good farming system, have a productive and long-lasting soil and environment system and land, make money along the way, because if we don't have money, we can't eat. Like, you know, don't be shy about wanting to make money. Um, and... You know, you can make money by being as productive as you can on the ground you've got or by having a, a lower productivity system with a low cost base. And it sounds like that's what you've done really well, Greg. 
over with, with that scale that you've got to be uh, enable you to do that. And so there's one of the things I found when I did the research for the book was um, like we all of you, you know, when you drive around, you'd notice you can almost pick the changes of of um, ownership by the ba the fence, the fences, and and that shows that everyone is, even though they might not know it, they are values driven, and different things are important. You know, Bruce has probably got really straight fences and and um, not a wire out of place. Um, and, you know, my fences are, are the opposite of that at the moment. Hopefully they'll be new soon. Um, but the point of that, that comment is that that got me fascinated when I was working as an agronomist. And when you're sort of 30, 25, 30 and don't know what you don't know and you're a science trained, ag science trained, research background, measure everything, which I love about your, your talk and the fact you are measure everything. Sometimes you can be a bit, a bit of a know-it-all at, at that age and just remember that you, anyone who's younger than 35 in the room. And, um, and you actually, what I wasn't getting at the time was the human element. And so I'd get frustrated with clients for, you know, not doing what I thought was really bloody obvious but there are other things um, in the background. And when I did the research on the book, the, I found, stumbled across this fascinating study from Western Australia. Some of you may have heard of a, an economics professor called Professor Ross Kingwell. And um, he's uh, based over in WA. And he and a WA ag economist called Lucy Anderton took a a whole heap of benchmarking data that already existed from um, Plant Farm, one of the consulting groups over there, and Bank West, so 249 farms. Then they did social research as well as the economic research and the physical data. So they collected everything, including what you did on your weekends, who was involved in the bowls club, who was involved in the footy club, how much time did you spend off the farm, how much time did you spend on the farm, what level of education everybody had. So it was a really broad spectrum study. And then that, you know, as well as the usual suspects, rainfall, soil type, blah, 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 blah. What they did next was the bit that I loved about this study. They did really sophisticated statistics on it. So things called principal component analysis and anyone who's been to uni and had the misfortune of um, being shown what that is, uh, it, it's, you've got to be a lot smarter than me to, to know how to use it. But what it does is it clusters the, mo the significant things together, the things that are important, and it's a statistical way of working out what's important. What do you reckon – so this study was done over 11 years. What do you reckon was the most important thing when it came to explaining the differences – of financial performance from one farm to the other. So if you had all your data in this survey, what do you reckon was the most important thing? Well, okay, so we've got a few there. Saw type, social connection, well-being. Anyone else want to have a go? Family. Anyone else want to have a go? Skill set. So lots of, lots of votes for human elements here. What about rainfall? What about machinery expense? What about interest rates, soil type? You know what it was? It was actually all those things combined. It was what they called the farm effect. It was the most significant factor was the combination of all those things, the combination of the human... Uh, resources on the farm, the people, the combination of the decisions they made, as well as the luck to be farming at, you know, Mekathara versus Albany. All of those things combined to be called what's the new, unique characteristics of the farm, that was the number one factor. So it was more than rainfall, more than soil type, etc., etc. 
So the point of that, um, if anyone's watched uh, Life of Brian, Monty Python, there's a little scene in there where he's um, standing out the window and he wants all the, all the crowd to bugger off and he stands out the window and starts yelling, you're all individuals. And they go, yes, my Lord, we're all individuals. And he's going, no, I want you to think for yourself. Yes, we must think for ourselves. That's the point of this. Basically what Joe and Greg were saying to you, Tom, is that we're all individuals. So it's about taking the threads of um, the messages and the themes from their experience rather than trying to replicate the formula. And so and that's so what I tried to do in the book was look at all the evidence and what is it that that um, what's the formula that that is repeatable when it comes to, to cropping in terms of making um, money out of farming over a, a long period of time. But most of the principles apply. I use just use crops as a ter as a metaphor for productivity. So I want to go through the rationale behind that, and how I came to these conclusions. I didn't make this stuff up, by the way. Um, I actually gathered as many studies as I could, like the one I just talked about. But one, some of them were done right here through people like Phil O'Callaghan and. Daryl Poole from RMCG and, um, you know, there's plenty of studies around, Bill Malcolm, Ed Hunt, BCG studies. I gathered as much data as I could and I think the fancy way of describing this is doing what you call a meta-analysis where you grab as many studies as you can and there's a quote from um, a very smart lady whose name is, and she's a, um, she's a person who who um, she calls herself a practical futurist, Wendy Alford, and she says that noticing patterns can help unravel complexity. And basically what I did was try and look at the patterns, the common patterns in all this data. And this data spread over 20 years and over a lot of different um, enterprises and it was the same thing every time. It was a combination of being... Um, productive, so efficient with your, um, with your use of your land resource for the millimetres of rainfall you had. It was being good with money, so having a profit focus and whether that be, you know, maximising or optimising revenue or being really good on your cost control. So a combination of those things in terms of, of profit, not just one, not just the other. And the last one was, was the people side of things. So most of these people had all the, the farms that I see that do really, really well are innately emotionally intelligent and have a high degree of self-awareness. Now, when I did the book, I didn't have the words for that at the time. That research has come out more recently. But when they did that first research in WA, it was about good relationship managers and people that are good at organising themselves, managing themselves, managing a team to get stuff done on time. Because timeliness is everything because Mother Nature waits for no one. So they were the principles that I kept coming across and then when I started working for myself, I got frustrated that everywhere you went, we just talked about one individual thing. So when we started talking about ag tech, you know, it was just, well, innovation's gonna save the world. There's a lot of interest at the moment, and quite rightly so, in um, emissions reduction. And, and um, finally, we might be getting recognised for all the natural capital that we do look after. But again, they're the tools. They're not the end point. And what I wanted to do was talk about the basic principles and timeless truths of productivity, people, profit, and self-management, crops, people, money, you, and that farming itself is an art and, and when done well, um, you know, the returns are there. So that's, that's what I was, I was interested in and hopefully, hopefully I've achieved that with a few yarns in there as well. The other thing I think about um, is that so, – and, and basically on the productivity side, you know, soils are the basis of that. 
bringing it back to today, soils are the basis to that and climate. So, you know, you, the, um, the universe has dictated that you guys are at, at Loddenvale with um, grey clay soils on, on a floodplain in an environment where we might get a decade of not much rain and then, you know, and then a decade of quite a bit. The, the universe has dictated that my family farms 5Ks out of Elmore, a farm that um, Grandpa bought on Dad's birthday, um, which is actually 100 years ago last month, and Grandpa was expanding on the farm that um, was selected on the Raywood Road in 1870, and Grandpa's wife... Um, her family had been farming in the area for 1860 along the, along the Bendigo Creek. So, you know, that's the universe put the McCormicks over there. We don't necessarily control that unless you make it, unless you're a first or second generation farmer where you've act actively gone somewhere. But what we do is we can make the most of that. And if you, one of the things I find interesting at the moment when we talk about soil, we don't actually often talk about land. But I love land and my values is I get a real kick out of being on a piece of land that I'm associated with. So whether it's a paddock of nevs that we might have gone in on a, on a crop walk 15 years ago or probably longer um, or it's the piece of land we bought four years ago. To me, I, my recreation is going and um, poking around chipping Bathurst Burr on the bit of land that, that I bought. You know, I'm a weird person who finds that fun. Um, and, and the farm we grew up on, like, it, it, it's in you. And that's that value stuff again. So it makes commercial – and that land now at Elmore is probably 9000 bucks an acre based on recent sales. When Grandpa bought it in 1924, in today's money, so dollars an acre – what do you reckon he paid? Anyone say, did you say 9,000? Not far off. Anyone else want to have a guess? A bit less than that. Ah, uh, less. Think about what land was worth around Elmore three years ago. So, or well, seven years ago. So, if Grandpa paid, I think it was eight pounds or something, and it, the equivalent is uh, $3,000 an acre. So when land jumped from about $1,500 to $3,000 an acre seven years ago at Elmore and everyone thought the universe was going to collapse, I actually did that calculation thought, oh, okay, just keep buying, boys. Um, and then that made it, motivated me to think that land at um, Turumbri for the price we got it for wasn't that bad after all, but I'm not going to tell you what that was. You can work it out yourself. Um, <laughs> But I will say, I will say that it had doubled in two years. So it was about identifying relative value. So, but there's commercial sense in caring for your land. So there's value sense, there's environmental sense, biological sense, but there's also commercial sense. And people have made, been making decisions about caring for their land for a long time. And I just want, I like to put a long-term perspective on things because quite often we think, uh, you know, all these problems are new. I don't reckon it would have been much fun in the 40s around Pyramid Hill or Elmore. And I don't reckon it would have been much fun in the 20s when the land around Grandpa's place was all getting um, acquired for soldier settlement. Just like it hasn't been much fun around this community in the last 20 years with, with the change in in structures and the change out of irrigation in a lot of places. So there's always something going on over history, you know. This stuff isn't new. So that's just a bit of perspective, I suppose. Going on to um, why I think it's possible for a quarter of farms to be twice as profitable, one of the things of all these data sets I looked at was there was this, again, a pattern. If you took you know, the top 25% or 20%, depending on how it was represented, and then you looked at the median or the average price, consistently there was at least a two-to-one ratio. So what I mean by that is there might have been a data set that came from um, the Wimmera 
um, over a five-year period and it stated that the median return on, on capital, operating return, this is, the median operating return might have been 7% and the top 25 might have been 14% or, you know, the figures might have been 3% and 7.5%. There might have been a dairy data set where the, the top 20... Um, and these are examples, not verbatim, like not actual data. I'm just trying to get the concept across to you. So the top 20% of a, a, a dairy group might have been uh, 14% and, and the uh, median was, was 7 This This pattern, and I just got more curious, I kept trying to find more data sets and it keeps coming up. And even if you do it on more recent data, this whole thing of one and a half to three times the difference between the high performing group and the rest is, is, is a thing. So I started thinking about that in a different way, not about what should we be doing to be like them. I started thinking about it in, well, if they've all got the same rainfall and they've all got the same, relatively the same soils and the same amount of resources available to them, yet in a given year, some people can make twice as much money as the other, then there's an opportunity for improvement there for 75% of the population if they wanted to. They don't necessarily want to and they might not have the capacity or the capability or lots of reasons why they wouldn't want to. But to back that up, that number up, the productivity statistic for wheat in Australia overall is based on our water limited yield potential, we produce about half. In hardcore cropping districts like the Wimmera, they might be up there between 70 and 80 per cent. But in really wet years or good production potential years, they're probably back to 60 per cent. But that's got a lot better in the last five years when they've realised um, the value of putting out more nitrogen after some research. In mixed farming areas like this one, that number's more like 35 per cent. All through central Victoria, those numbers, when you're talking about crop production, the average is about 35 to 40%. So even if you didn't want to go full throttle, on some farms, just by simple things like time of sowing or better nutrition, you can double your yield. Particularly in, in, um, in, in strong years. So to give you an example of how that works in, in reality, as I said, we farm at, um, at um, Patho or, or Trumbury. It's a dry land brock, um, would have been part of Patho Station a, a thousand million, or well, not a thousand million, but 200 years ago. Would have been part of the native grasslands a thousand years ago. Um, that block is traditionally known as two and a half tonne of the hectare wheat country. We've been really lucky since we bought it because we've had the last four years. Um, and because of my background of measuring and testing, I've been able to work with my share farmers and encourage them to lift their sites from three tonne, which they thought was a, a fair enough yield in a, in a um, good production year. And even though we knew we were going to lose 30 acres through to water, we actually doubled our urea inputs in... Um, in 2022 and put out 200 kilos to the hectare of urea, which is not the norm for dry land at, at Patho. And the boys did a really good job. And um, even though we lost 10% of the paddock, they stripped 5.6 tonne of the hectare. And then last year, their barley's probably gone four, four and a half tonne. Um, and it wasn't just about yield and urea though. We, that paddock, in its previous life was um, basically treated like an outblock. It had barley on it for about 10 years because the perception were there were subsoil constraints, high frost risk, so they didn't want to spend any money on it and they just grew it to barley. So when we inherited it, quite a huge weed problem and um, it was pretty hungry. So we just went back to basics, went vetch first, 
fetch hay to, to manage the risk. Then canola, we got a late start in the canola, it was pretty nervous, it still ended up okay. And then wheat, then barley. So what we're trying to do is manage the seasons, manage the risk, but at the same time look after the soil and, uh, and the guys are doing a really good job. So I, I just wanted to use that as, as, as a real life example of, of what can be done in, in this neck of the woods. Now, I know I've only got about five minutes to go. So just on the decision making stuff, some really simple frameworks for you. Impact versus investment. What's the impact, both good and bad, and what's the investment? So I've got a decision to make. Am I going to wear a beanie to the footy or am I going to wear that hat? What's the impact of if I get that wrong? Cold ears. Am I going to die? Probably not. How much time am I going to spend on that decision? Yeah. <laughs> Tweezies versus cheesels. Impact? Not much. They're both disgusting yellow things <laughs> full of chemicals that we probably shouldn't eat. Signing on to a carbon sequestration project in dryland agriculture, what's the potential impact of that in 25 years' time? What's the potential good impact of it in 25 years' time? Not sure. Un yeah, possibly. What's the investment required to... Um, to follow that through. Joe, where are you? You've probably got a stronger idea of what it would take to engage a spurious carbon aggregator and the rest. Well, we haven't engaged anyone like yeah, because you're smart. <laughs> That's right. Well, the, Greg. The, the contract that we could have taken out that said we had to use year 25 and 100 grand for the year. Yep. Yeah, so it's a reasonable amount. Um, of coin and but what you did was a small area. If that was over 700 hectares, you know, huge consequences. So it's just a really simple thing. I really worry the amount of or the lack of time people spend on making machinery decisions. It's enormous money, enormous money. If you looked at, I spent a bit of time uh, in corporate and the amount of. Um, Number crunching we did for every machinery purchasing decision, every land purchasing decision, compared to what we do intuitively as um, born and bred farmers. So that's, you know, that's one area we can get a lot better at. The other aspect of decision making I want to touch on is group decision making. Who farms on their own and is the sole decision maker? Three of you, you lucky buggers. <laughs> Who farms in a group? So with either their kids or their partner or parents? Most of you. Most of the information that we give farmers, we assume we're talking to one decision maker, but we're not. So I've got a little framework that I call the 4A framework to help with this. I think non-decision making is one of the biggest curses that holds us back as a community. So my framework is awareness. So that's the measuring, whether it's environmental measuring or financial measuring or just purely production measuring. How, how, much, how much wheat could have we grown? How much did we grow? How much income could have we made? How much did we make? So that's the awareness side of things. The next step, this is the tricky one, is acceptance. Somebody in the family wants to make moves on succession planning. Someone else in the family doesn't want to think about the fact that they might be redundant. So they can't accept the fact that we've got to talk about succession planning. Or they can't accept the numbers that have been put in front of them by their smart aleck consultant. So we've got to get to acceptance. So acceptance is about numbers and mindset. 
So is the first one. It's about numbers and mindset. Then comes a really tricky bit as a family. As Brad knows, I've got four brothers and a sister. And he knows three of my brothers and they're very diverse individuals, aren't they? And we're not naturally good at agreeing in our family. So how do you agree as a group? And sometimes that's when you need an umpire. And again, it's about, absolutely about getting external advice, but it's about um, mindset again. And the way to get agreement is to think about your end point. So back to the values again. If you want to get to, if the, if the thing that you all agree on is that you want this farm to be managed well by the grandchildren, then you have to get to that point because that's what's at stake. So that's agreement. How am I going? I've got awareness, acceptance, agreement. Now, the last one's action. And by action, I don't mean jumping in the, in the tractor and going and deep ripping a paddock. The decision to make each of those, to commit to each of those points is an action itself. The decision to stop being a pig-headed you-know-what is actually an action. The decision to be more self-aware of your impact on the family is an action. So just that's a little framework that I reckon is helpful. The other last one I'll leave with you about decision-making in a complex world is thinking about towards choices and away choices. So you've got your end point, you've got your goal, where you want to go. Are you moving towards that or the particular action you're going to do or is it going to take you away from that? And um, I think, actually, I will, I'll do one little quote before I finish off. Yeah, actually, I'll do a couple of little quotes. So the late Dr Stuart Hawkins, who is my rural sociology lecturer, he warned that concentrating on parts of the system without understanding the impact of the whole system may not make the farmer more money or provide a better life. In fact, it can do quite the opposite. So that's about looking at everything as a whole. Now, the last one I'll leave you with is, um, is a quote from Uncle Basil. So Uncle Basil um, said to me one day, and this was the motivation for us to buy a little bit of land, he said, money has a habit of falling out of your pocket, but it never falls out of land. And he was 99 when he said that, and he'd started buying land in uh, 1951, so I reckon he knew a thing or two about it. So I'll leave it there. Well done. Thank you, Kate. Please put your hands together for Kate. I'll take that. Thank you, Kate. There's a lot of gems in there that I think we can all learn a lot from. Uh, appreciate the time and effort you've put into that. Uh, we'll agree to improving soil health and, uh, and celebrating today. We might not agree on which team we're going to back for to tonight, that's all. Um, <laughs> so with that, so that wraps up all of the presentations uh, for today. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just wrap up with a few things at the end. As we mentioned earlier today, you know, the event really is about highlighting the importance of soil understanding your soil so you can make informed decisions and sound advice. Um, and we hope today's event really provides you with some of those thought-provoking ideas. Please don't hesitate to make the most out of the fantastic resources that we've discussed today and worked through. So there's the resources bag that Darren will uh, gleefully be handing out to everyone on your way through. Make sure you remember the QR code that Beck spoke about as well. Jump online, utilise that resource there Beck will always answer any question. You've seen the passion that she's had today. She'll be more than happy to work with groups or individuals or um, whichever they may take. Don't forget to re uh, also refer to our de other Department of Ag, Ag Vic staff as well, North Central CMA, the resources in the room as well, the people that have lived experience and the journey that they've been able to work through here um, and, and really take advantage of that. Once again, just acknowledging North Central CMA, Agriculture Victoria and the Australian Government's Smart Farm Small Grants Program today, uh, that for being able to put on today. Continue to look for opportunities, continue to invest in yourself and your core values. 
uh, and think about what your journey is and how you're going to make the most out of that. I think it's been a key element that the Bears have been able to share with us. Um, and, and really continue to, to you know, work together as well. The CMA is very proud of the work that we've done with local communities over a very long time. There's a lot of issues that we've touched on today. If you'd like to know more about some of the drainage issues today, for example, there's Harley, who's happy to have a chat to people, uh, you know, whether it's salinity or whether it's uh, agricultural productivity or holistic farming, whatever it might take, um, please take advantage of those opportunities uh, to work with us. I will give a little plug on the 13th of June in Bendigo at the Capital Theatre, there's a natural capital forum being held as well. So if you'd like to know more about that, we can take a trip down the road and, and learn more about uh, what the Bears have been able to introduce that to us. And there's a flyer on the table for us if you want to take advantage of that. And of course, um, the evaluation forms, if you could fill those out and hand them in, that'd be really appreciated. But I think uh, apart from that, of course, a piece of cake on your way out and make sure you grab your resource bag. A big thank you to Darren uh, for putting on the project today and the support we've had from Mel, um, from Tom, from Harley, from Tam, uh, from Mandy and myself, thanking Brad as well, the Ag Vic team in, in Beck and, and, and Co as well. And most of all, thank you for coming along, uh, being part of today, asking your questions, participating in the discussions um, and I hope you've been able to get something out of today. And, and I hope you have a safe trip, trip home as well. Thanks, everyone.